So, hey, my name is Martin. I work at U2I. Um, what's really nice about U2I is that we're all encouraged to use self-development hours on whatever belie we believe brings us some value. And in the office, we have this cool space with sofas where we can simply lay down, rest, uh, read a book, or simply think. And uh, since I like thinking, I've been thinking a lot recently. And I came up with a few thoughts that I would like to share with you. So uh, my lightning talk is called The Future of Programming. In fact, it's not going to be any science. It won't give any precise answers, neither. What I would like to do is just to highlight a few things that I believe are relevant in terms of, of the future of programming. Before we get into that, I would like us to step back to see the big picture of what was the way that programming came since its beginning. In order to see where we are heading, let's see where we came from. So, have you ever wondered what was the first, first algorithm ever written? Can anyone guess? So, first algorithm was written in 1842 by Ada, Ada Lovelace. Interestingly enough, she was a daughter of the famous Lord Byron, and once she was asked to translate an article by uh, one of um, Italian mathematicians on Babbage's newly proposed machine called Analytical Engine. And with the translation, she appended a set of notes. And one of the notes contained uh, a method for calculating Bernoulli's numbers. And because of that work, she's now, now widely considered to be the first programmer in the world, and her, her method is considered to be the first algorithm ever written. Then decades passed until the first computer was constructed. I'm aware that there's been some computing history before that, but uh, with this slide, just let me pay tribute to everyone who contributed to breaking the Enigma code. Of course, at the end, it was Turing and his team, but uh, there are many fathers of that deep victory, including Polish mathematicians who paved the way for Turing and his team. Uh, some historians claim that uh, breaking Enigma code shortened the war in Europe to, well, from, one to, uh, from two to four years, saving millions of lives. Can you imagine that, that some primitive machine running some prehistorical code saved millions of lives? That's really a big deal. But coming back to Turing, in 1936, he, proposed, he, he, he published a paper and in that paper, he proposed some kind of a machine, later known as a Turing machine, and that machine can be recognized as a computer. And in, that no in those notes, he uh, wrote a code that you and I would recognize as a code, running on a computer with binary as, as an instruction format. Next decades brought a huge growth in programming languages. Uh, so, just to name a few. Fortran, one of the first, least first functional language. Simula, considered to be the first object-oriented language. C, timeless, you, considered to be one of the most widely used languages of all time. Prolog, first logical language. C++, initially named as C with classes, took its object orientation from Simula. Ruby, uh, multi multiple purpose, supporting many different uh, programming paradigms. Uh, Java, write one, once and run everywhere concept. C Sharp, which is, in fact, C++, uh, or Swift, which was, in fact, described as uh, Objective-C without the C. Um, sorry if I didn't mention your favorite language. It's not the list of top languages of all times. What I'm aiming at is that all those languages differ. Some are object-oriented, some are functional, some are compiled, some interpreted. However, there's some common concept that lies at the root of all of them. And those are not that different from the code that Turing wrote. In fact, most of the modern languages, those are Turing complete. And um, what I believe is that in the future, 
it's not going to change much. There will be like new languages appearing, trying to address the issues of older languages, and then, by the way, introducing some other issues. Um, so, it, you see, it just goes round and round. So, what I believe is that what we need in, uh, in software, we don't need another revolution. It's, we don't need another cutting-edge language. We just need some kind of an evolution. Um, here's another thought linked with that. So, in the, left, uh, in the left top corner, there's a punch card. It was used by programmers to represent their, their code. Long story, story, long story short, um, so programmers, they used to fill such cards, then handle it to, to computer operators, then they got it back after 24 hours. They were lucky just to learn they forgot the semicolon. Uh, can you imagine that, like, in the past, we didn't type? So I would lie us by analogy just to open our minds to some other input possibilities, some hardware invention. Uh, speaking of hardware, uh, not sure if everyone is familiar with Moore's law. I will simplify it just to make it really straightforward. So um, computational capabilities, they double, double every two years. So right now, in fact, we reached the point where um, the power, or actually the capabilities of uh, processors are comparable to the, mice, the, the, the brain of a mouse. Uh, in fact, in the morning, in the opening speech, it was said that uh, like, uh, computational power uh, tried to... Um, uh, try to uh, like balance, uh, to find, find a balance between like, computational power and, uh, and complexity of the brain. So, in fact, we reached that point. And in order, what I believe is that in order to go further, we need to win some kind of also hardware evolution. And let me point out a few potential directions. So, there's optical computing that uses photons uh, produced by laser and diodes for computation. There's quantum computing that uh, uses the laws of, uh, of quantum uh, mechanics to uh, represent, represent data. Uh, DNA computing that aims at replacing silicon with DNA chains and biochemistry. However, that looks like, uh, even though there's been some uh, Already, there's been some developments in those domains that looks like uh, like, like uh, uh, rather distant future. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Ourselves, let's uh, make it relevant to now. So, in the world, uh, there are computers everywhere. Uh, every day, we interact uh, hundreds of time with times with some machines running, running code in medicine, science, education. And let's do some uh, thought experiment. Uh, imagine that in one instant, I mean, there is some explosion, massive explosion in the sun, and in one instant, all the computers in the world stop working. What would have happened? I believe that would bring humanity to, to the dark ages. For sure, it will be really dark. And the only difference is that in dark ages, we knew how to deal without computers. Right now, we, we all depend on them. So, as, as I said, there are like computers literally everywhere. So, who's writing that code? So, that, we're writing that code. That's, that's who. And, uh, like, there are a lot of new developments in many different domains. Like, here's the Da Vinci surgical system. Uh, Tesla running out, uh, with its autopilot mode that will, is probably s like the beginning of, uh, for an opening for self-driving cars. Uh, there are drones uh, that will re replace militaries. Um, I mean, and the question is, what happens if something goes wrong? So who's going to be blamed? 
Uh, in, there's the picture. Uh, you can see the picture of Tesla car uh, after, after the accident. It's, in fact, it's not proved that it was the fault of the coat, uh, uh, but for sure, like, driver was running out autopilot mode, but it's not confirmed that it was the code. But uh, just for a moment, let's think, what if it was the, 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 the fault of the code? Like, how would you feel if the code written by you would kill someone? And that's one of, in fact, that's one of the challenges that we need to face in the, in the years to come. Uh, we need to be disciplined. Uh, Robert Martin, uh, he did some research and he figured out that uh, the number of computer scientists, or the number of programmers, doubles every five years. In fact, that's good for us, like there's a lot of work uh, uh, for everyone. But uh, what does it also mean? It also means that there's a constant rate of programmers with experience less than five years. It's not necessarily a problem, but it may become one. Since there are a lot of new developments, uh, it's, there's a chance, hopefully not, but there's a chance there will be more accidents. And then who's going to be blamed? For sure, not the business. We have a great power lying in our hands. However, keep in mind that with great power comes a great responsibility. So with this uh, talk, I would like to raise our awareness. Uh, we need to share our knowledge. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to teach others. We need to teach ourselves. We need to be disciplined. Let's start it now. Let's start it at our workplace. Do the good things. Let's, let's be good in small things and we'll be given authority over bigger things. The future of programming, whatever it is, whatever new technology will come, it, it belongs to us. It lies in our hands and let's do the good thing. Thank you.